Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Micha Sifri. I work with the Personal Democracy Forum and Tech President. Um, it's a lot of fun to be here. I've been to some of uh, Simon and Pete's talks up in New York, so it's fun to come and, and make the trip down and, and join the conversation with you. Um, I have to say I, I'm suffering at the moment from a little bit of PowerPoint envy because Pete's presentation was um, really fantastic and, and uh, uh, virtuoso in, in his use of the tools. And I'm, uh, I've, I've tried for a long time not to actually uh, learn how to use this because I think if power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. And, um, <laughs> So we're not going to, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and frankly, uh, uh, Pete touched on really a lot of the same themes that I wanted to emphasize. Uh, so I'm going to try and, and just sort of amplify and clarify a few things, and, and uh, hopefully it'll begin to sink in for you. Uh, the, the topic I want to address is what is network politics and how is it changing the system? And to start out, this is kind of the old model in, in pure, uh, purified form. The P is the politician or the leader. The C's at the bottom are the citizens. And it, what we all grew up in is a system that was uh, top down. The kind of communication that happened was one way from the top to the mass. It was expensive to participate in, in terms of actually uh, having voice in the process. It was driven by elites. The only day when masses of people actually got to participate was election day. And it was very cold. Uh, there were all kinds of gatekeepers for entry into this, whether it was the actual campaign organization or the media gatekeepers. Uh, you know, uh, William Sapphire actually referred to uh, the great mentioner uh, in terms of how conventional wisdom was formed. There were just a fairly small group of people who controlled all the choke points. Um, now, this is, I think, radically changing. And what we are seeing is the emergence of networked politics. And again, this is just building on points that Pete made earlier. It isn't just that you still have that communication coming from the top down to the mass of, of individual citizens. Uh, you have citizens able to talk back. And most importantly, you have citizens able to talk sideways. They can network with each other. And the effect is that the bottom and the conversation and the activity that happens among people in the bottom becomes much more important. Instead of one speaking to many, you have many speaking to many. The cost of entry is much lower. And as a result, we are seeing mass participation by citizens every day in the process, not just on election day. And here's the fundamental change from the point of view of campaigns, advocacy organizations, institutions, it's out of your control, OK? And uh, I want to emphasize three particular ways. It's in terms of creation of message, uh, management of field, and um, raising and, and spending of money. It's out of your control. Uh, if there were journalists in the audience, I would also talk about how creating the story was out of their control. So you, we've already talked about this uh, particular image. We all know it as the Hillary 1984 video. Um, this was the first political viral video of, of uh, the cycle. It's been seen now more than 5 million times on YouTube. I want to emphasize something about those YouTube numbers. And, and Pete mentioned them earlier. YouTube only counts a view if something is watched to the end. Um, and that means that, it doesn't mean that the person is still sitting there. You know, you can obviously walk away from your computer. But when you see a number like 5 million, that means it's 5 million full views. OK? Um, and the cost to Phil de Valise of making this was a few hundred dollars. Um, and the cost of distributing it was nothing. This is another example of a viral video, the Yes We Can video that came out before Super Tuesday. More than 14 million views on YouTube. Just as a point of comparison, that, that came out in February. Um, for the month of February, the data suggests that the Barack Obama campaign website had only a total of 3 million visitors. So far more many views of this pro-Obama video than visits to his website in the month of February. Again, the campaign is no longer being created just by the campaign. It's being created by all these millions of new participants. Um, one lesson here for the consulting class is uh, 
they're not very good at making viral video. Uh, this is a still from the Hillary and the Band video that was made by the Clinton campaign, I think in January is when it came out. Um, go watch it, it's awful. Um, it sort of has her playing air guitar and it's, it's, it's only had about 400,000 views. It was an official Hillary uh, Clinton campaign video. It was their attempt to reach young people and the thing was really uh, inauthentic from the beginning. There have been far more effective pro-Hillary videos made by grassroots supporters for her than the campaign has made for itself. Um, now, Phil DeVelise, I think, said it best. This is the guy who made the, the, uh, uh, that YouTube video of uh, Hillary in 1984. This is after he was unmasked. You know, he, originally he was anonymous. He used the moniker Park Ridge 47, which for some of us signaled that he wanted a scavenger, fun to, a scavenger hunt to happen. Park Ridge is where Hillary was born in Illinois in 1947. Um, he said, the future of American politics rests in the hands of ordinary citizens. This ad was not the first citizen ad. It won't be the last. The game has changed. Now, let's talk a little bit about how it's changed in the field dimension. Uh, you've all heard about this by now, the numbers of people who are friending candidates. The candidates have gone where the people are hanging out, places like MySpace, Facebook, other big social network hubs. What you're looking at here is a chart. We, this is something we do over at Tech President. We, we started tracking these metrics going back to the beginning of 07. And the blue line there is Obama's uh, uh, rising numbers of, of um, friends on his MySpace page. The first thing you should notice about that is that, let's see if I can point. Ooh, look at that. Um, right there, that's the beginning of, of his campaign. He already had 40,000 friends on MySpace the day his campaign launched. How is that possible? The answer is, is that a volunteer going back two years earlier who had watched his speech, uh, actually three years earlier, had watched his speech at the Democratic Convention, was so inspired by it, created a MySpace page for Barack Obama. It was available, myspace.com slash Barack Obama. And it was a fan page. And this volunteer, Joe Anthony, toiled away at it every day, responding to emails from people who wanted to know how they could find out things about the campaign, where they could register to vote, to the point that by the time the Obama campaign started, they already had 40,000 friends on that site. And the campaign tried for a couple of months to work in collaboration with this volunteer. In other words, to let him keep running this very useful URL, myspace.com slash Barack Obama, uh, if people were looking for Obama on MySpace, it was the likeliest place to find him. And then in April, they had a falling out. We reported on it quite closely. I could, we could get into more detail about what actually happened. But basically, the Obama campaign decided this was too valuable a place on the web to allow a volunteer to control. The guy is a paralegal living in, in Los Angeles. He's not in Chicago at campaign headquarters. They made him an offer. Uh, to, in essence, let us take over the site, just tell us what you think it's worth to you. He responded with a number, approximately $40,000. Then the campaign said, what, are you crazy? We can't pay you $40,000. They had a big split. We reported it. Um, and the, the result was a big black eye for the Obama campaign, by the way, because it showed some of us that they were not quite as friendly to their grassroots as it appeared because they wanted to control this very valuable place. They lost all of these friends. It went back down to zero because they had to start over. Um, when they took over that URL, it basically started with a blank slate. In the end, it didn't really kill them. They're actually up to about 350,000 there. Um, but it's a cautionary tale. I think they'd be much higher, by the way. Look where they were going um, if they hadn't had that, that whole uh, episode take place for them on MySpace. Um, here's another interesting metric to take a look at. This, the reason this is here, this is the Facebook friends for the candidates. Again, the blue is Obama. Um, and by the way, if you go to our site, one of the fun things there is you can uncheck any of these boxes. You can, you know, you can play with the data and see, you know, the trends more closely or spread out over the course of the year. Uh, we do the same thing for seeing how candidates are, how often they're mentioned on the blogs, um, uh, what their YouTube views are, uh, so go play with it. But what I find fascinating here is this 
here's this takeoff point. That's January 2nd, 3rd, 4th. That's the Iowa caucus, okay? And then there's New Hampshire. And look at this rocket, okay? Obama goes from 200,000 friends on Facebook to over 800,000 today. The same effects that, that uh, Pete was showing you in terms of the fundraising numbers, we're also seeing it in grassroots affiliation with the candidates. Um, other examples of how the campaign is moving into the control of the grassroots. This is a site called Eventful, where people can not only list events, political events, this, this is their, uh, they're showing all the political events coming up around the country. Blue is Democratic, red is Republican. Um, they can also demand events. And the Edwards campaign latched onto this early and realized this could actually be a great driver for participation. Let's have a contest and with whatever town around the country uh, votes has the highest number of demands for uh, John Edwards to come, they'll, uh, he'll go there and do an event. And um, it started out, you'd think the big cities would have the advantage, uh, but uh, an activist in Columbus, Kentucky, a young, a young man decided that rural America needed its place in the sun and started uh, networking in all the ways that he could think of. And ultimately, Columbus, Kentucky, was getting votes from other parts of the country, other small towns that were voting for it. Basically, they wanted to get a presidential candidate. And by the way, presidential candidates don't go to places like Columbus, Kentucky the year before the election. It doesn't make any sense. There's no money there. There's no media there. There are no early primary votes there. But something new is going on where people can demand, express demand, and candidates begin to respond. Ron Paul also did an event based off of this. I think some of the other candidates have as well. Um, fundraising. You all know about Act Blue. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just to say, again, anybody can create their own PAC now. And the numbers are really starting to get impressive in terms of the, the fundraising that these networks are generating. What I did want to show you is what happened with the Ron Paul campaign, which in, in at least this one area has been the most innovative. Unlike every other campaign this cycle, Ron Paul's uh, 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 was the most decentralized, um, out of control, if you will. And what this shows you is what happened after they started publishing real-time uh, uh, fundraising data on their site. Um, and there's a longer explanation for why they did that. But basically, they decided to put individual donor information as it came in. Name, city and state, amount. People started taking screenshots that would show, you know, look, I gave, right? And the, the, that kind of uh, virtuous cycle where people could, you know, sort of show their friends, I'm doing it, why don't you do it? This enabled people to create what became the Ron Paul money bombs. And these two charts, the first one, the, the smaller one, is, um, shows what happened on uh, November 5th, which was Guy Fawkes Day, the first one. They lined up about 40,000 people who all pledged to give $100 on the same day. They raised more than $5 million in one day. Uh, they did it again on, on the Boston Tea Party anniversary, December 16th, close to six, a little bit over $6 million in one day. Ron Paul raised more money in the fourth quarter of 2007 than any other Republican candidate for president, thanks to open source fundraising. Now, I'm gonna just finish with two observations about uh, what lessons do we learn from this. The first one is, that the network is more powerful than the list. Uh, this is a, uh, I like to ask people, what would you rather have? Uh, an email list with a million names on it and Bill Clinton who, uh, who is gonna sign your emails and let his name appear in the subject line or a thousand bloggers blogging every day on your behalf? Which would you rather have? And I'm gonna argue that the list is less valuable. Obviously, it's not an either or choice. You wanna have both and, but the Clinton campaign spent most of 2007 building one and not the other. And the result is lists are a one-way form of communication. Um, if the person signing the email's name in some way degrades in value and people are less inclined to open an email from Bill Clinton, the list is less valuable. A network, on the other hand, and this is just a map of the political blogosphere um, from uh, 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 a couple months ago, the, these are all Democratic-oriented blogs. Yellow is uh, media sites. Red is the uh, Republican side of the blogosphere. Um, my last point uh, on the media effects is 
that the sound blast may be more powerful than the sound bite, or at least they're in competition with each other now. Um, Pete alluded to this. What we're seeing happen with the Obama campaign's use of uh, video on the web is they're providing a huge amount of content. They have more than a thousand videos that they've posted to YouTube over the course of the campaign, a couple more every day. And if you look at uh, the, the, t the top videos on that site, um, the average length, more than 13 minutes long, um, people are hungry for content. They are not getting it from television because television is by nature a scarce medium where time is limited, where we've seen the sound biting of politics, the amount of time a politician is quoted on network news is dropped from 43 seconds to 10 seconds. That's the, the incredible shrinking sound bite. Well, we're now living in the age of the growing sound blast and the availability the people are going to the web to get more information is what that says to me is not only uh, the first point that campaigns have to invest in building networks, not just lists. The other is that they have to produce and distribute a lot of rich content. And the 37 minute speech that uh, Obama gave on race, uh, which for a whole variety of reasons would be of interest to people has now been viewed more than five million times. Again, five million views of a 37 minute piece of, of uh, video. Um, it's an enormously powerful new effect. I'm hopeful because I think it means that content may actually start to matter more than just sound bites in the political fight. Um, and I think this is just another example of how we are really beginning to live in a new age. Um, would love to continue the conversation both here and uh, online and at our conference. There's our contact information and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, talking to a lot of you here today. Thank you.